Welcome to the film analysis, today with Lord of the Rings by Peter Jackson. Tolkien's universe represents a modern myth, which mainly draws on old myths, using many references and creating something of its own. The film adaptation has been tremendously successful and establishes a modern pop cultural myth as well. However, we must defend the trilogy a bit before criticizing it. What's it all about? The Hobbit Frodo must bring the One Ring to Mordor to throw it into the fire and thus strip Sauron of his power. Frodo is accompanied by Sam, Merry, Pippin, the wizard Gandalf, the elf Legolas, the humans Aragorn and Boromir and the dwarf Gimli. They face, among others, the Nazguls, the Orcs and the Uruquai, who are superior to the ordinary Orcs. Saruman also wants the ring, but Sauron possesses the real power. Here is the absolute evil, the Dark Lord wants the ring and Saruman also soon falls under Sauron's spell and becomes his servant. Again and again, the film adaptation were accused of being racist. Why? First, critics point to only white people being on the side of the good guys. A kind of master race being glorified here, while the orcs and the other bad guys are drawn from racist stereotypes. Some appeared to recognize Afro-Americans, First Nations or Aborigines. Here colonialism is refined. The Hobbit represented a fascist community. This is shown by the traditional gender order, the clear hierarchy, the new medieval lifestyle. But is it that simple? In all these accusations, criticism was usually based on representation. How are the individual characters drawn and what can I read from them? First, one must be careful not to fall for one's own stereotypes. But the fantasy genre does not allow such analogies to appear plausible so easy. Analogies and conclusions like these characters stand for Aborigines don't work consistently enough. On the side of the good guys are white characters, but in a way they tend to be very diverse and colorful. There is really no question of an Aryan master race in the case of the Hobbits. If at all, it perhaps applied to the Elf Legolas. But what about the Dwarf Gimli? Let us remember that Richard Wagner portrayed the Dwarf Alberich in an evil way in his opera Der Ring der Nibelungen, even creating an anti-Semitic caricature. Lord of the Rings does not do that. It rather portrays an inclusive group. The picture of masculinity drawn is remarkable. We are not dealing with that kind of macho masculinity here. We are not witnessing a cult of masculinity of the kind found in fascist currents. Just think of Frodo and Sam's relationship. How sensitively and tenderly they treat each other. How often they cry for each other. Several generations and ethnicities struggle together in the film. We are dealing with a very multicultural group. Presumably, one wouldn't go for an all-white cast nowadays. But we should ask ourselves if a little more diversity could really solve the main issue. It's safe to assume most critics would settle for more diversity because they fail to recognize a core problem with the trilogy. This brings us to the criticism. 
the issue here is not one of representation, but of ideology. The Lord of the Rings is a deeply ideological film because it divides the world into good and evil. What's wrong with dividing the world into good and evil? The political theorist Carl Schmitt defines the political as the distinction between friend and foe. That is a political category. Good and evil, however, mean moral categories. Some might object that these are conceptualizations, just words, not at all. There is a fundamental difference. Friend and foe constellations can be warlike, but they allow for peace to be made. Friend and foe mean recognizing the enemy as an adversary, but recognizing it in the true sense of the word, that is, not discriminating against it. One may dispute over a piece of land, both states may have different interests which are clarified by military means. Karl Schmidt explains that this was not always the case. We had the Crusades, the Middle Ages, but a shift occurred. Karl Schmidt writes in his book, The Normals of the Earth, about the Treaty of Westphalia. Quote, Thus, at least for the land war on European soil, a control and limitation of the war had indeed been achieved. The change from the confessional international civil war of the 16th and 17th centuries to war in the form, i.e., to the state war of European international law that we know today had worked the miracle. The European state emerged out of the blood wedding of religious wars and with it the elevation of the European land war to a pure war of states, a work of art of human reason. Karl Schmidt further explains the essence of such wars was an orderly measurement of forces taking place in a cherished space before witnesses. Such wars are the opposite of disorder. In them lies the highest form of order of which human power is capable." End of quote. Schmidt even compares these wars of the Westphalian order to the duel to emphasize their fairness. That is, if we think in the categories of good and evil, it is about a just war including infidels who must be fought, destroyed. An interstate war, as Schmidt describes it, which constitutes the modern state, modern Europe, no longer implicates annihilation fantasies, these discriminations of the enemy. But if you wage a war in the name of justice, meaning not only a war due to different interests, then you have arrived not at the usual enemy, but at absolute enmity. It no longer allows to distinguish between soldier and civilian, while on the good side we still experience recruitment processes in the Lord of the Rings, who will stand against Sauron, the good side sees on the bad side only absolute enemies. On the bad side, everyone is declared an absolute enemy simply by group affiliation. We don't even witness any civil life with the uh, other's pure ethnicity suffices to become an enemy. This carries fascist traits. But it is also reminiscent of the current drone killings, which no longer allow a separation between military enemy and civilian. The sentiment here is actually, you always hit the right people. The idea of just war is natural to Christianity. It demonizes the unbeliever as the absolute enemy. This is how crusades were legitimized. Tolkien was a very Catholic author, enabling us to understand the character Sauron. Here we are not simply fighting against an enemy, but against an absolute enemy. Sauron is evil, he represents 
the devil. The ideology of just war has long since returned. Just uh, think of George W. Bush establishing the axis of evil regarding Afghanistan and Iraq. This accompanied by a dehumanization of the enemy. We see this particularly clearly in the orcs. In the meantime, this has also become part of linguistic usage. One speaks of an orc when one wants to devalue someone. Today there are propagandistic accounts on Twitter and TikTok where Russian trolls describe Ukrainians as orc and vice versa. Well, now you can say in The Lord of the Rings that's fantasy. They must be portrayed that way. Certainly overtaking the common racism accusations, seeing oppressed Aborigines or Indians in The Lord of the Rings doesn't work. It remains of course fantasy. But the film does create beings with whom you don't sympathize. They are supposed to be ugly, to fit into the paradigm of just war. We know this from, uh, this from many Hollywood films that sketch the evil Russian, especially in the 80s cinema. At the same time, something else appears, always latent in Hollywood. The sacrifice, the willingness to sacrifice oneself. We also see how, before the battles, everyone is sworn in to fight until the very end with just one man left standing. Just think of the many speeches Theoden holds, stressing over and over again how he would prefer to die gloriously. A delicate fantasy. If we were to imagine this war, especially the end of the second part, as a war in our world, we would be immediately horrified. There is also an interesting detail in the third part. Pirates appear at the harbor, the enemy boats of the Corsairs of Umba. But Aragon, Legolas and Gimli fight the Corsairs with the army of Oathbreakers. These oathbreakers live in hiding in the mountains because they are damned. Society rejects them, they must have been committing crimes, so they are virtually criminals, have been punished and live outside of society. Why do the oathbreakers have to show up now to fight the Corsairs? Corsairs, private pirates, are illegal criminals. Any means will do when fighting criminals. The classical friend-foe distinction of an interstate war ceases to exist. The lines blur. If one speaks of the just war, everyone's criminal. Here one fights criminals with criminals, namely the Corsairs with oathbreakers, in a certain way. The Lord of the Rings applies Guantanamo's logic. The letter stating any means, including any illegal means, waterboarding and so on, is justified with these criminals. The films were released at the time of the US wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and mention the people of the West. But that is interchangeable. It doesn't implicate Peter Jackson creating propaganda for these very wars. The ideological structure matters. Let's take the other perspective, that of the evil side. They too believe that they are fighting for the just cause from their perspective. Therefore, the trilogy can be easily appropriated, for example, by right-wingers. Italian fascists referred to Tolkien in the 70s and the extreme right-wing politician Giorgia Meloni is a fan of Lord of the Rings. The films pretend that war and thus politics is a question of good or evil. 
they furthermore essentialize these are the good guys, these are the bad guys. But the small and big criminals of human history and those who chose them and fought for them were not evil in so far as they rubbed their hands diabolically and said it is so nice to be evil. Great criminals don't resemble Sauron uh, representing pure evil. It's more complicated than that. The good evil dichotomy in The Lord of the Rings is more reminiscent of a media de depoliticization strategy. Now you can find politicians and journalists who say Putin is like Sauron. But this overlooks Putin's real geopolitical interests. And you have to understand, the bad guys often think they are good guys. The bad guys are convinced of doing good. At some point, internalizing the respective ideology means considering crimes a necessity to build the perfect society, or rather, apparently, not even committing crimes. The supposedly evil ones believe that they must fight the sinners, establish a hierarchical society. They either consider themselves the good guys, or if they are enlightened, they know that politics is less about morality. Those are usually legitimation strategies when you argue morality, but in truth it's about enforcing interests. The Lord of the Rings trilogy carries a false sense of politics. It gives the impression that politics ultimately must disappear to re-establish order and a harmony of consensus. Everybody rejoiced when Aragorn became king in the end. We must remain vigilant when everyone is rejoicing. The political disappears here. That is why the film ends in the private sphere with the hobbits. They represent the apolitical person. They live day by day for themselves, celebrate their little parties, enjoy silly jokes, picking blackberries, but avoid being involved with politics. The Lord of the Rings glorifies consensus and absolutism with the hobbits. And that's the reason why right-wing politicians love Tolkien. They want homogeneity inside of the state. But let us return to the friend-foe constellations in the larger geopolitical context. Foreign policy is understood as an imperialist unipolar world order in which every opponent is declared an absolute enemy who may be destroyed. This very world order also permeates the community. One transfers this order. Unconflicting positions are desired here. One does not desire an agonistic politics of opposition, but a depoliticized politics. We know this from a politician's speeches when they invoke a so-called great new middle or centrism. It is reminiscent of the so-called third way declared by Tony Blair and Gerhard Schröder. Democracy is represented here as a shire where no one rebels. We don't like to talk about power in liberal societies. Politicians like to promise politics for everyone. That is precisely what needs to be criticized, as the political scientist Chantal Mouffe in her book The Democratic Paradox does. She writes, the democratic society must no longer be conceived as a society that wants the dream of perfect harmony in social relations to be realized. The main task of democratic politics then becomes not how to eliminate power, but how to constitute forms of power compatible with 
democratic values, to recognize the existence of forms of power and the necessity of their transformation while are at the same time rejecting the illu illusion that we can completely free ourselves from power is the specific specificity of that project we have called radical and plural democracy. But the Lord of the Rings contains this very idea, this fantasy that you have to eliminate power. The film depicts power, after all, as something very evil, just take Gollum. Like the good guys in The Lord of the Rings, we, like Frodo, believe that power must be eliminated. This is untrue. One must share this ring, must share the power. In a way, the gesture of throwing away the ring, of letting it burn, is right. We find this gesture again in variations in Harry Potter. Harry Potter repeats Frodo's act when he breaks the Elder Wand. The Shire's harmonious sentiments at the Lord of the Rings and mislead. The power emanating from the ring would have to be divided, ordered and organized. Only then may political positions and forces be clashed. In any case, there is no shire and the longing for the apolitical endangers us. It may even lead to the next just war, to absolute enmity. It makes us misjudge the political so that we watch but don't see. It would be nice if you would like to support the film analysis financially. You can do so via my bank account or PayPal. Also, you can find me on Patreon. Thank you very much.